name is Steve Crump, and I am the president and owner of Vola South Farms, which is where we're at today. Vola South Farms came about in the 1880s when my great-grandfather moved down from Illinois to the Glenwood area, and they started buying orange groves. And then over time, they, they added to it, and then more family members kept it going, and that now I'm the fourth generation. Vola South is about 200 acres here in Volusia County, and then we still have the original family farm that we still farm in LaSalle County, Illinois. The name Vaux LaSalle is an amalgamation of Volusia for the Vaux and LaSalle for LaSalle County, Illinois. So it's the two counties put together. So our main crop has traditionally been citrus and we did everything, oranges, grapefruit, tangerines. We were transitioning away from that and now we're doing much more vegetables in addition to citrus. My favorite thing I like growing is citrus. Without a doubt, I prefer to grow that but um, in, I haven't had much success in the last couple of years. The citrus acreage is actually reducing. We actually have less because of citrus greening disease. Right now, we're currently down to about 40 acres in production. Citrus greening disease is a virus disease specific to citrus, but it's all types of citrus. So lemons, limes, tangerines, grapefruit, every citrus will be, can be infected by it. The insect that spread it is called the Asian citrus psyllid. So it's an invasive. It arrived, I think, about 15 or 16 years ago to the state of Florida, and with it came the virus disease, citrus greening disease, and now it is endemic. Almost every tree that's grown outside will be infected. Citrus greening is that widespread that it is considered, every tree grown outside is considered infected. Two years ago now, it, we planted trees inside what we call a screen house. So this is a post and cable structure covered with a fabric net and the net it goes over the top and down the sides and is buried into the ground. And then we installed a roll up metal door and then a personnel walk door. So this is completely encapsulating the orange trees to eliminate the small gnat size insect that spreads citrus greening disease. We have a special uh, working relationship with five ducks that are in the greenhouse. When we encapsulated the orange trees, we also encapsulated an invasive snail. It's a little brown snail. It doesn't cause much problems, except the population exploded because we excluded any natural predators. There was nothing to stop the snail, nothing to eat the snail. So these, we went from a few snails to hundreds on every tree. So to get rid of them, we put in something that would eat the snails, and that's these five ducks. It took them about six weeks but they have actually, we, we don't see the snails inside anymore. It's been amazing how well they've done. They're, they're an integral part of our operation is this natural pest control, but they don't ask for pay raises yet. These are fresh from the tree. So. We've done a few projects like this in, in the past where they, where they harvested stuff from our farm and they actually cooked it on site and served it. Those were fun. Um, but this would probably be the first time that they've, they've done something off site like this. And that's, uh, that's encouraging and interesting to, to be a part of that. The farm to table events are, they're important because they remind people that food can be local and it can, fresh local produce often tastes better and it's part of the economic fabric of the, of the community. The more, diverse, the more diversity we have in our economic uh, industry, it helps all of us. So we are open um, mid-October to mid-May, and we're open on Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays, 10 to 4, and Sundays, 12 to 4. And of course, you can find us on the website under Bola South Farms or on Facebook. That's another great way to find us. When you arrive, we encourage you to come into our little farm store. We'll, we'll greet you and show you what's available. We have a chalkboard with a list of what's available and the prices on it. And then we'll give you a basket and some cut, cutting tools, maybe a, maybe a knife like this to cut lettuce or a pair of clippers to cut squash. And then we just pretty much turn you loose. We'll have signs on the rows as to what things are and what the price will be out in the field. But pretty much we encourage you to come out and and pick what you want. I, I, grow, I get great pleasure in growing plants. And I get pleasure in watching families harvest it and eat it and enjoy it. Our tagline is fresh, local, healthy. And I think the fact that it's fresh and local 
makes it taste better. Flavor and freshness, we got them beat. I'll tell you what. So when you see the chicken served, Chardonnay. You know, a lot of people start calling my dad, you know, probably back in the 80s, they start calling him the Barefoot Farmer or Barefoot Bill. Um, and everybody, I assume, out in this community, which there used to be about 50, 60 family farms out here, um, you know, during the you know 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. Um, and so I think in those days, everybody probably farmed barefoot just because, you know, people didn't wear shoes as much. My uncle didn't wear shoes till he was a senior in high school. My dad didn't wear shoes till he was in eighth grade to school. Um, but when you're out there working in the fields, it's really challenging to like work in and out of plants and walk in mud and all kinds of different conditions with shoes on and then go to the barns and try to wash things. I mean, they just become covered in mud and dirt and they become too cumbersome. Plus sometimes you can't feel plants or feel cucumbers with your feet when you're mm -hmm. picking. So it's just better, easier just to farm barefoot because it's almost impossible to wear shoes out there. And so, you know, my dad showed up at the farmer's market with those shoes on and people are called, started calling them barefoot farmers. So we just, uh, you know, it's part of our, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes we have a logo that just says barefoot farmer, but barefoot farmer is, uh, you know, a big part of what we do. I mean. You know, we use tractors to till ground and, you know, to haul loads of vegetables and stuff out of the field and to plant certain things. But just about everything, you know, from even the seeding is done with like with a hand seeder um, for most of our crops, uh, any of the weeding and stuff, a lot of it. Some of it's done with mechanized twirlers and stuff as you go down, but a lot of the stuff is done by hand. All the harvesting is done by hand. Um, from the okra to cucumbers, lettuces, greens, everything is done by hand by just, you know, myself and my dad and, and my wife, so. Some places, you know, they might come in and do one big swiping and they'll cut everything out at one time. You know, we'll harvest stuff for about three weeks. We'll pick cucumber patches over and over and over again for a three to, you know, three to four week time. Same with squash patches, same with like kales and Swiss chard and things like that. We'll pick off the bushes, let them grow back, pick them off and let them grow back. Um, you know, and some of the big farms are gonna come through and make one big swipe out of them and, you know, and then sell them when they have fields coming behind it. But just with our size farm, you know, we're trying to utilize, you know, the stuff as much as we can and then, uh, you know, switch over to new crops, so. Yeah, so farm to table event, uh, all our all our greens are coming in right now, like our greens and our radishes. So we're gonna supply some greens, some radishes. We should have some early broccoli, um, some early lettuces. Um, what else are we probably gonna have for that? Probably some early kohlrabi um, and some spinaches, um, things like that. Probably still have actually some okra, cucumbers, uh, some peppers, and uh, zucchini and yellow squashes as well. So we got a pretty good variety of stuff. This is kind of a, a overlap time of the of the seasons where we got winter crops starting but the summer crops are still here and so we have a little bit of both coming in so in my opinion art is uh, is universal it comes in all sorts of forms as you know and somebody once told me a long time ago it's all art there's good art and there's bad art but it's all art all art so food always comes from somewhere, as you know. It's, it's quite the thing to talk about these days, you know, the, the journey of food. So when I know the journey of food, as I do in the case of many of these ingredients, it makes me really happy as a chef. It inspires me in ways that otherwise it's hard to kind of find that, you know, that storytelling. I'm a big fan of telling the story of food. Pasta and 
bruschetta on the tables, okay? Which will be probably now, okay? So as soon as Winnie gets utensils, you guys can come out with her, okay? And that's the team. Let's go out here to the table. Here, we'll do cheers with water. That won't get you in trouble. <laughs> Tasting as you're cooking is an incredibly powerful, simple way of making sure that the food is good. And it's, a, it's the power of tasting your food. Because something may look okay, but we don't eat with our eyes, we eat with our palate. I know that's a phrase that people use a lot. You eat with your eyes. Not really. You eat with your mouth and your taste buds. You may appreciate something with your eyes, but that's not how you eat. Uh, you eat with your palate and you have to make sure it tastes good. It's sometimes overlooked in the even the best professional kitchens. They take a lot of time to make sure the food looks good. Uh, and sometimes they forget to taste it before they send it to the guest. And that happens in every kitchen because it gets very busy. You know, it's incredibly high energy and things happen. But um, it should be something that should be a part of your repertoire is to like, oh, let me taste that, let me taste that, let me taste that. Uh, this is more of a family style, so okay. guys, guys, thank you so much. Guys, so say hi. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, you're going to have to do something. It's awesome. Oh, it has like, I have Chardonnay. Yes. I just want to tell you what I'm cooking and what I'm using to cook. So the vegetables are from two farms, I believe, uh, ones that I've supported for a very long time as a restaurateur. Uh, Thomason Farm, the barefoot farmer in Samsula, you may know him from the Volusia County Farmers Market and other places. And then Volasal Farm, Steve, the Crumb family, they've been around for a long time. They're primarily citrus growers here, but they grow corn and, uh, and uh, soy in another part of the country for a different application. So that's, I mean, that tells you something because farm, farming is challenging and to make a living is one thing, but to actually make a good living is extremely challenging for small independent farmers. And so it's not uncommon for farmers to diversify and have to do different things for different applications. And we're seeing that here. So the vegetables, as I can see, and this is real time, I'm just kind of making this up as I go. Uh, squash, uh, two types of squash, zucchini, there's some uh, a candy cane radish, uh, celery is not really uh, in the ground right now, but of course, Central Florida is celery capital of the world, as you know, so that's not a stretch. Uh, peppers growing from Volasal, citrus, of course, and then some fresh herbs. I have thyme and basil. I am a huge fan of local seafood. I don't know if any of you like seafood, but I, I'll, I'll make a long journey just to get just the right kind of seafood for my food. So this morning, before I came here, I made a trip to King Seafood in New Smyrna Beach. If you know the place, you should support them if you can. But I got some fresh local cobia, and it's one of my absolute favorite fish to eat. So I was ecstatic when I saw that loin of cobia in the display there. So I'm going to cook some cobia for you in a pan. I'm kind of known for my ad nauseum uh, lectures about sustainability when it comes to seafood. 
And, and that's because, you know, it's a world that we're sort of unfamiliar with in many ways because we can see what's above the ground, what's underneath, it's kind of harder to see unless that's your life. And so it turns out uh, we're overfishing a little bit and, uh, and uh, we're damaging the oceans a little bit. And so it's becoming harder and harder for these fisheries to survive the way, the way they always have. But so that's why I feel like it's important to uh, support all local things and first. For me, for the most part, when things are local and small scale, they're almost automatically sustainable. If it's a small, small scale local operation that's independent, you can rest assured it's going to support the community beyond the business itself. It's when things get on a larger scale, then you kind of have to pause a little bit sometimes. So local Kobe, I'm just going to pan roast it with the help of some white wine that the bar generously provided for me. Uh, and then some, uh, just a little relish of local vegetables. So, cobia is a slightly thick and dense fish, as you know, and I'm not sure how many of you cook fish at home. Uh, if you do, that's great. But I find that, generally speaking, folks are a little nervous about cooking fish at home for a number of reasons. The aroma, the smell, uh, the, the stress that you might overcook it, uh, etc., cetera, et cetera, or undercook it, heaven forbid, but sushi is not a problem, apparently. So, <laughs> uh, you know, those are all stresses. So, cobia is a little dense. It's a semi-firm fish. Um, it's not like snapper. Snapper, you look at it and it cooks itself. This is more like grouper, but not as dense as grouper. It's a different kind of fish. It's its own thing, as you know. So, as a, you know, timing is everything. You saw how immaculate the timing of the food was this evening, because the team back there was doing a tremendous job making sure they knew when to cook, what to cook, when to bring it out. So the same is true with cooking. Vegetables are going to cook almost as long as the fish is going to cook. But I have to start the fish. Uh, in this pan. So, um, so cobia and you know I'm gonna take them off this paper towel so what that does by putting them on a paper towel ever so slightly for a little while is it takes off the excess moisture on the fish and moisture doesn't get along with caramelization or browning right so that's like a co a cooking 101 when you want something to get brown you have to make sure it's relatively dry so let's say you cook skin on skin on fish like say salmon there's a very a uh, popular technique with chefs, they'll take the back of a knife, first of all you pat the salmon very dry on both sides, but you, there's, there's still moisture left on the skin. You take the back of the knife and you kind of brush the skin of the salmon. You'll be amazed as to how much more moisture comes off that skin. And that one little move will allow you to create a perfectly crisp piece of skin on a fish. So next time you make skin on fish in a pan, after you pat them dry, go one more step, take the back of a knife, and just brush the skin of the fish and you'll see all this moisture that comes out. And that extra move will make that skin extra crispy. I don't need to do that here because this cobia doesn't have any skin. Cobia skin is a little bit uh, more on the dense side so I typically wouldn't serve it with the skin on. Extra virgin olive oil on the fish and in the pan. In both pans because I'm going to do the vegetables about the same time as I'm going to do the fish. Now this is important. This is already smoking so let me take it off a little bit. Don't be afraid to take off the pan, turn off the heat. You know, nothing is permanent in the kitchen. Everything can be recovered from, in my opinion. So it's not like you have to start over. Just take it off the pan for a moment, let it cool down. This is super important. Oil the fish or whatever it is you're cooking and season it with the oil on. I find often that I see a lot of cooks and chefs even who season their proteins that are, all, that are dry. And in my opinion, it forms a more accurate crust than if you put some oil on the fish or the steak or the chicken, and then you put the seasoning. That first step of putting a fat medium between the protein and the seasoning creates a more uniform kind of rich crust as opposed to a dry kind of a crust. Just try it and see what happens with you. So I don't need a lot on this fish because there's a lot of other things going on here. Now let me jack it up. Okay. So that's doing its thing. I'm not gonna worry too much. Uh, I'll have to cover this because typically I would finish this fish in the oven. I would finish the fish in the oven. Uh, maybe six minutes, five minutes. Any more than that and you're overcooking the fish. So what if I told you a breast of chicken takes as long as a piece of cobia? How many of you cook a breast of chicken for about 15 minutes? Don't. It's about six minutes, if that. A breast of chicken is cooked in six minutes, about as long as it takes this piece of cobia to cook. And you'll be amazed how moist that chicken will be if you just cook it that long and let it rest in the pan. And by the time you eat it in five minutes, it's gonna be perfectly moist. 
Okay, that's happening. Now for the vegetables. I'm just going to saute these vegetables. It's quite the melange of vegetables. I have garlic here as well, but uh, I don't want to use the garlic just yet. You'll see what I mean by that. Typically people start with garlic. I like to kind of put garlic halfway through the cooking process. While it's still in a fat medium, putting garlic in a moist medium is an entirely different thing. You don't get the flavor of garlic like you do if you actually uh, fry the garlic, as you well know if you made sauce. So what's in the pan has a huge effect on how what happens to the ingredients. If it's a fat medium, a certain thing happens. If it's a, a liquid medium, a certain other thing happens. Uh, if it's a dry medium, a certain other thing happens. It may sound like I'm overthinking all of this, but these things kind of come second nature after you've been cooking long enough. And they all kind of add a little something to the end result, in my opinion. A touch of salt, not a lot. Now we watch and wait for a second. Okay, this fish is ready to turn. If you notice, not once did I look to see where the fish was. It's the sound of the fish. So high heat is the trick in professional cooking. High, quick heat when you start, turning it down when you need to, finishing things in the oven when you have to, deglazing with some wine or liquid or stock when you can to take off all that fond, F-O-N-D, from the bottom of the pan. The caramelization, the brown bits, of course the French have a term for everything, so fond, F-O-N-D, is the term for the caramelization that happens in the bottom of a pan when you cook something. So deglazing is just that, to deglaze, to take that fond off the pan to make it be part of the sauce. And that's where all the flavor comes from. You don't want to rinse your pan in the sink. That flavor that's in the pan is incredibly rich and, and satisfying, if, as you know. So. Okay, I'm going to turn this fish one more time because I've got them golden brown on the other side. And now for some white wine. Just take it off the flame. And I'm actually going to help it along a little bit. I'm going to cover it and I'm going to switch off the flame. That's it. The flame is off. I'm just creating some steam in the pan and it's going to finish steaming the fish. This is almost done. Um, I'm ready to plate this dish actually. I'm going to squeeze some fresh lemon on top. You know this is going to taste good, right? Fresh vegetables, wine, fresh herbs, citrus, fresh local fish. I mean, okay, I'm going to plate this for you. And you can do a rustic farm to table plating as we're doing here, whether you even leave the time in there to show them that there was time in there. Or you could take it out and be fussy about the plating. So I'm going to leave it in there just so you can see. And now here's a little trick. This has a lot of, this has a lot of seafood flavor. If you have the if you have the ability and the inclination, you want to reduce this wine sauce down. You've got the seasoning on the fish, the flavor of the fish, clean, dry white wine. Uh, if you want, you can put some more herbs in it and reduce it down. All of a sudden, you've got a pan sauce. So right now, this is a, without a sauce dish. I don't think it needs it because everything is fairly moist in here. But if you wanted a sauce, you bring this down to about 10% uh, of its volume. So it's an intense flavor. Taste it. And the restaurant chef cheating thing is to put some heavy cream in it. You don't have to. Sure. Completely leave it out. Don't put cream, don't put butter. Uh, and this is a completely, you know, uh, dairy-free dish. It's not necessary. Right. Looks tasty, right? Yes. 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 Beautiful. I very much enjoy what I do. We look forward to getting up in the morning and, and coming and do this. I really like growing things and I like seeing people eat it. The reason we're all standing here and able to wake up every day and do the things we do is because we have food and we're just, you know, really the world's getting less and less a less access to local quality foods and so for me it's just super important that I'm out here growing food that people have access to. I have a farmer's market here at my farm every Saturday so every Saturday people know if they need food, they need fresh vegetables, 
they can come here and get it from me so that's really why I like it so much now it's just I just see it as um, is just such an importance you know just a really a vital uh, vital link in uh, in our chain of life and I'm glad to be part of it